Greetings, everybody. This is Dan Gardner, and on behalf of Trade Facilitators Incorporated, I'd like to welcome you to this week's installment of our coronavirus webinar series, this one entitled The Role of Global Trade Management Software in Supply Chain and Logistics. A couple of administrative points to, to go over. I, I noticed on the registration list, and, and we have a lot of people on today, uh, that there's quite a few new names, uh, actually people from all around the world. So it's flattering to see so many people online. But uh, just to give a background, I, I call it the coronavirus webinar series. Back, this is the 10th week that we've done this, a complimentary, objective, supply chain oriented webinar on different subjects. Going back 10 weeks ago, decided that every Wednesday at 1030 West Coast time, we'd try to make a contribution to, to the discipline of supply chain management by providing information, sharing information, best practices, learning from others, et cetera. This is the 10th installment of that. Hard to believe that it's May 20th. With that said, th this presentation is a little bit different from other subjects for, for one really important reason. And that is some of the other subjects we've covered like material requirements planning and letters of credit and INCO terms is very much facts-based, uh, which is to say INCO terms are INCO terms. We can certainly offer opinions and anecdotes and experiences and such, but the INCO terms rules, the shipping terms, th those are the rules. Same thing with letters of credit. What we're going to do today is really share insights and observations and, and experiences about the evolution of global trade management software in supply chain and logistics. And, and because it's going to be a, just a lot of experience and opinion from trade facilitators that welcomes a, a lot of dialogue and you're certainly welcome we have a lot of people on so we have to keep the mics muted but you can write in questions you can challenge what we say and and we welcome that because i personally do not profess to be an expert on gtm software i will profess to be a student of the game but I, I think through dialogue and questions and even calling out things that we say, we'll reach a higher supply chain truth together. So please do that. You can write in your questions and such. Uh, another, another point is that well, we get a lot of requests for copies of these presentations and we're happy to share them in PDF format. There'll be an email at the end that you can write into and we'll gladly send you the presentation in the spirit of shared learning. There'll also be a recording that, that goes out of this as well. Having said all of that, let's get down to business here. Always a disclaimer, uh, we are not lawyers. We're here to share information and experiences, as I said just a moment ago. So please don't interpret anything we say here as legal advice or counsel. In terms of an agenda, it looks like a long one, but we have slides of, of true meaning, maybe 20. So we'll go 60 minutes. I'll stay as long as people want to stay on and ask questions and debate and such. But we're looking at about 20 slides here. So we have a lot of material to cover. Let's run through this fairly quickly. First of all, the, the definition of GTM, global trade management software, has expanded in recent years. So we're going to start out with a baseline of providing a, a definition of what it is. From there, roles and objectives of GTM software solutions. What are these solutions, these digital value propositions, what are they intended to do? We'll go through solutions by function, meaning actual business functions, business disciplines, whether it's demand management or warehouse management, et cetera, et cetera. We'll get into categories of GTM solutions providers. And we'll mention some, some names of companies, but not in the spirit of promoting those companies, but giving examples. Again, we try to keep this as objective as possible. We're going to break it down into categories. We came up with 15, actually. There's probably more, but to keep, keep things tight for this conversation, 15 ought to cover it in a 60-minute in a, in a presentation. We'll talk about pricing models and how they've changed over the years and become so reasonable and, and affordable, along with a, a strong value proposition. We'll get into challenges for software firms, opportunities for further innovation, and then some of my favorite GTM categories. To remind everybody, because people, I can see people are coming on now. If you want a copy of the presentation, we'll gladly send it to you. You don't have to write in during the presentation and, and ask for it. You can write to an email at the end and there will be a recording as well. 
quick intro to trade facilitators. That's who we are here in California. Just a one slide on TFI, no, no hard sell, no sales pitch. Uh, we're supply chain consultants and training people, and we're located one town over from the Los Angeles Long Beach Port Complex in what is today sunny Palos Verdes, California. We essentially do four things. Work with shippers, importers, exporters, domestic shippers to design logistics programs, which includes the deployment of technology, do a lot of advising in that sense. I personally came from the third party logistics space, what we used to call freight forwarding and customs brokerage, been involved in over a dozen acquisitions. So we do due diligence for 3PLs looking to buy or sell. We advise digital startups focused on logistics and supply chain, and we do training on topics specific to global trade. That is it on trade facilitators. So let, let's get down let's get down to brass tacks here and, and put together a what I, what I will admit is a probably an incomplete definition. But we had to put things into into scope into a framework for purposes of today's discussion. Otherwise, we could literally be here for weeks on end. This is more of a framework setter. I'll, I'll admit it may be an incomplete definition, but it gets the job done for today. So what are we talking about here? Because it has changed quite a bit, software space, GTM, as it's called, Global Trade Management Software. It's comprised of hundreds, if not thousands, around the world of companies that provide solutions in areas that include multiple facets of international supply chain management. We're going to point out what those are in subsequent slides. Certainly logistics and transportation management, trade finance, letters of credit, documentary collections, documentary credits, things of that nature, and import and export trade compliance, export regulations, restricted party screening, compliance with free trade agreements. That's what we're talking about there. To give an idea of the market, users of these solutions can include importers, exporters, domestic shippers, and those companies could be manufacturers that are acquiring raw materials overseas, for example, to build a finished product in the United States and sell domestically or, and or internationally. They could be companies that import finished goods. It really depends on the business model. The carriers themselves, and we're talking about truckers, drayage companies, steamship lines, airlines, railroads, etc. The industry that I came from, freight forwarding and customs brokerage, the companies that facilitate the movement of goods, travel agents for cargo, if you will. 3PLs, that stands for third-party logistics companies that oftentimes do freight forwarding and customs brokerage, but engage in value-added services like pick and pack and reverse logistics, things of that nature. The banks on the trade finance side of things, cargo insurance and third-party inspection companies. Here's a little perspective on the development, the evolution of GTM software. It seems like going back, goodness, 20, maybe 25 years ago, that when you heard the term GTM software, it was originally associated with the automation and management of import export regulatory compliance functions. Again, export licensing, restricted party screening, the proper maintenance of classification numbers for the HTS, the harmonized tariff schedule, things of that nature. It's broadened out, much like the term 3PL is broadened, actually. I mean, everybody's a 3PL today, but it could be a, a one-person trucking operation. It could be a multinational organization. It's a broader definition these days. So from a solutions perspective, and we will go into this in more detail, the term GTM software has expanded to encompass things as diverse as demand planning. That has a lot to do with product forecasting, an importer or an exporter forecasting how much they're going to sell in a given time period. Manufacturing planning and control, certainly transportation management, logistics operations, warehouse management or a WMS, warehouse management system, visibility tools, freight tracking, digital freight platforms, and data analytics. Again, we're, we're, we're establishing a, a framework within which we can continue our conversation, but it is a very broad business. And I would have to say that there's hundreds of companies, but let's go with thousands globally. I think we might have a question here. Just one second. No, maybe not. False alarm there. Okay. So let's move on. And that's going to be the last kind of wordy slide that we'll 
we'll see. For the scope of today's discussion, because again, we, we could go on and on and on. We're going to narrow it down to, to a, a substantial percentage of the overall GTM business. So as we know, there's a vast ecosystem of solution providers out there. For what we're going to talk about, we're going to limit our scope to a couple of areas. First, GTM providers, the actual software companies that offer solutions directly to importers, exporters, and domestic shippers. And as I said a moment ago, it could be a manufacturer. It could be a wholesaler. It could be a design company that focuses on marketing and they just import finished goods. It all depends. But we're, here we're talking about those software houses that are selling solutions, providing solutions directly to those companies. That represents a big part of the ecosystem, as we'll see in subsequent slides, but it doesn't represent all of the ecosystem. Uh, what we will say here is that in our discussion, certainly we'll, we'll talk about the provision of services. But if you think about it, this whole ecosystem lives off the physical buying and selling of goods. The actual importer, the actual exporter, the actual manufacturer, the actual domestic shipper, everybody is in service, maybe a degree or two of separation apart from a, an actual shipper or manufacturer or importer or exporter, but everybody's serving that, that physical buying and selling of goods. That's a theme that's going to come up a couple of times. Within that framework, second sub bullet point, third party logistics solutions that create internal efficiencies be they a warehousing and just a fulfillment house, a freight forwarder, a customs broker that are creating solutions that help them be more efficient. Uh, 3PL business, and I'm not talking just about warehouse labor and such, is a very labor intensive business. So companies are constantly, and I'm talking about in office stuff now, or working from home, given the current situation, but always looking to create internal efficiencies. Sometimes those solutions are developed themselves, in-house, homegrown, as it's sometimes called, but there's a vast network of solutions providers that sell directly to those companies, who in turn, the three PLs, what are they doing? They're selling their solutions to the actual buyers and sellers of goods. There are customer-centric three PL solutions, customer-facing online quotes, as an example, or the ability to transmit a load request out of a transportation management system. These are customer-facing, customer-centric solutions that are developed internally, sometimes by the 3PL themselves, but oftentimes from a third party, and then sometimes overlooked because they're not, they're not as front and center as some of the more customer-facing solutions are hundreds, maybe thousands of companies that offer solutions and capabilities to the above firms. And as a first tip for today, and I, and I know that there's a lot of BCOs online to beneficial cargo owners, actual shippers, buyers and sellers of goods. If you are looking into GTM software for any facet of your business and you narrow things down, you're looking at maybe a half a dozen companies or whatever it happens to be, and you go on their site, oftentimes, not always, I think the more savvy GTM providers oftentimes will show a, a tab partners. And these are these companies that provide behind the scenes services to facilitate exactly what it is that software provider is offering. And I'm talking about things like cargo tracking and robotic process automation, things of that nature. But this is our scope for today. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's talk about the roles and objectives of GTM software solutions. I'm just checking to see that this is showing someone's hand is up, but then there's nothing, nothing there. All right, another false alarm. Okay, what is it exactly that these solutions providers are trying to accomplish? And we'll talk about specific value props and, a, and up value propositions in an upcoming slide. But depending on where that provider is in the ecosystem, which we defined from a scope perspective just a moment ago, depending on where they are in the ecosystem and the nature of their solution or solutions, important distinction to be made, GTM software has a number of roles and objectives. Once again, stating explicitly that it's going to depend on the, the nature of the solution and where in the ecosystem that provider is. But if you think about things, enable 
standalone business functions, companies that address one issue. I can recall just within the last year talking to a small software house in, in San Pedro, California, which is literally right next to LA Long Beach Port, small outfit, and they specialized in yard management for ocean containers. Now that might sound like an obscure part of the business, but anyone that deals with demurrage and especially detention on ocean containers and the need for a first in first out capability, that's a big deal. So that's just one example of a standalone function. There are many others. Here's a big one, one of, my, one of my favorites, the integration of discrete business functions, bringing together multiple operational aspects of, of a business and integrating those capabilities. For example, integrating the buy side of a supply chain, the acquisition of raw materials or finished goods overseas from the time a PO, a purchase order is issued through in-factory visibility, organization of international transportation, generation of documents associated with those activities. That's what we mean by integrating discrete functions. In that instance, purchasing into transportation, into trade compliance, which in this instance would be customs clearance. We'll talk more about these in just a bit. Facilitate enterprise-wide collaboration. Uh, one of my favorite buzzwords of all time, uh, enterprise-wide collaboration. That just means bringing together or creating the capability to bring together digitally multiple players in the global supply chain. We're going to show a visual example of that in just one second. Naturally, enhance your operational efficiencies. Big item, create visibility. Where at any given moment in time, anywhere in the world is a company's product in whose hands, et cetera. Enable facts-based decision-making, both dynamically, meaning live, as well as out into the future. A good example of that might be ocean container inbound tracking that contains hot inventory that allows an importer to allocate that inventory before it arrives at a destination port, thus reducing cumulative lead time. That's just one example. We, we could spend all day on this slide, so I'm just popping a few examples here and there. Impact future outcomes. Predictive analytics can help a great deal in that sense. Using business intelligence on past performance to help improve future outcomes as it relates to the accuracy of a sales forecast, as an example. Naturally, improve your financial performance and use all of this information, all of this data to create opportunities for continuous improvement. But in the end, if you think about it, everything that everybody does out in the physical world and in the digital world as well, as it relates to the services and solutions provided to the buyers and sellers of goods, in a grand sense, it's all about trade facilitation. I, I mentioned at the front end, and I believe this philosophically, deep, deep philosophical belief in this. I named my company Trade Facilitators in 1994, incorporated the company Never actually activated the company until 2007 because I, I just believed I worked in freight forwarding and customs brokerage, but I wasn't a freight forwarder or a customs broker. I was a trade facilitator, making it easier for people to do business because if it's easier for them, they're going to be buying and selling more stuff. And if I'm a freight forwarder, I'm going to be moving more and more stuff. It's really about trade facilitation, whether in the physical world or the digital world. Okay, this is the slide I'm most proud of. And it didn't take that long to put together because Google is just an amazing tool. It's what I call the Jerry Maguire School of Global Trade Management Software Solutions. And it's intended to interject a bit of, of humor into the conversation, but, but in humor, much truth can be found. If you're not familiar with Jerry Maguire, A, I have to wonder why you're not familiar with Jerry Maguire, but that's a whole different story. It was a movie with, with Tom Cruise and Renee Zellweger came out in 1996. And yes, I did look that up before, before the broadcast. And it's a story about a sports agent, but it's really a story about relationships, personal relationships and professional business relationships. Lots of great lines. You'll hear on the lexicon of the American culture today, some of these great lines that I think are relatable. This is not a gratuitous exercise. This is a relatable 
exercise. So hopefully you like it because I'm I'm really I'm really proud of myself. But we have a we have a question here. Oh, okay. So people, this is good. People are writing in what they think the the lines are. So that's that's cool. Thank you for doing that. So the first one. Help me to help you. And these are actual these are the actual scenes from the movie where, where the characters said these lines. That, that's Tom Cruise, obviously. Jerry Jerry Maguire. The big line: "Help me to help you." His his one and only client is a football player who's an excellent player, but a little on the recalcitrant side, a problem child, complaining all the time, et cetera, et cetera. And this is where Jerry, they finally have a come to Jesus meeting in the in the bathroom of the sports complex of the, the football team. And Jerry's saying, help me to help you. What's the relatability there? Think about this as a, as a GTM provider. What are you really asking your potential customer or your customers to do to really open up the kimono. Customer says, I want full visibility from the time I issue a purchase order until the goods reach my DC on the outskirts of Chicago. And you as the provider say, okay, I can do all of that, but I'm going to need your product master. I'm going to need your purchase orders. Essentially, all the information, proprietary information associated with that customer's business. And then the customer says, well, I can't do that. So it's a help me to help you situation. Second one, show me the money. Someone someone wrote in quoting this, show me the money. This is where Jerry's talking to his one and only client on the phone and the customer, the, his client is, is saying, and what I didn't look this up, but I think I remember the, 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 the character's name was Cuba Gooding Jr. He won an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor, actually. Rod Tidwell. And I cannot believe that I actually remembered that. But Rod's saying, yeah, I'll be your client. Your your one and only client, but show me the money. And it's all in this sense, the relatability component is is about return on investment. How do you prove as a GTM service provider to a potential or even an existing client what the real return is going to be? So it's really collaboration and outcome. Now this last one here, I'll I'll, I'll th this is probably the the scenario that every salesperson in the world, not just GTM salespeople, long for. But it's this one. Of course, you had me at hello. This, so this is the love interest in, in the movie. And of course, Jerry, for a variety of different reasons, screwed up the relationship. And towards the end of the movie, he goes back and, and lays his sales on Renee Zellweger and apologizes and basically lays his, his heart out. Goes through the whole thing. And at the end, she says, you had me at hello. So what, what salesperson doesn't want to deal with predisposed customers, meaning they already believe in the value of what you're doing. It's just a matter of creating the right value prop, integration capabilities, et cetera, et cetera. So my, my question to you guys is, where else in a live webinar on GTM software are you going to see relatable captions from a movie like Jerry Maguire? You should you should give me some digital applause on the because I can see that on the side. It's important from a collaboration perspective. That theme helped me to help you. Think about this in an international transaction, and this is a, a broad portrayal. In, in fact, you can see it here. The origin of the merchandise we're talking about a supply chain here is somewhere overseas. The destination is somewhere else overseas. That's about as general as you can get, but we're talking about physical goods movement that starts with this guy or lady right here. Whether it's an individual going online to buy a pair of shoes, B2C, or company to company, B2B transactions. This is a boiled down portrayal of an international supply chain. I think there's 10 entities here from the supplier overseas, the origin trucker, the origin freight port or transportation, et cetera. Doesn't include banks, doesn't include inspection, companies, doesn't include cargo insurance, doesn't include port entities. The point is this, if the th one of the themes of the benefits of GTM is going to be collaboration and sharing of, in of information across the enterprise, how do you do that with 10 or 15 different entities, all operating on behalf of the client, but in the end to their own self-interest, using different systems, how do you create value in that type of environment? Whether you offer a single solution, origin drayage software or an entire enterprise-wide solution. 
Where do you fit? What value do you, do you create? And how can you use the information that you generate as a normal course of your business to the benefit of your client in the form of business intelligence? Hold on a second. Wow, pe people are going off here about Jerry Maguire. We should just stop here and just talk about movies for the rest of the day. So th thank you for doing I'm glad you found that mildly amusing. I put some thought into that. It didn't take a long time to do the slide, but I, I put a little thought into that. So I'm, I'm happy now. Let's move on. <clears throat> Let's talk about, we talked about the help me help you collaboration component. Let's talk about ROI now, return on investment as it relates to show me, show me the money. <clears throat> and we're going to use as our example that that genesis of, of all international commerce as it relates to the buying and selling of goods, the importer, the exporter, or the domestic shipper. Again, could be a manufacturer, could be a wholesaler, an importer of finished goods. It doesn't matter for purposes of this conversation. We're talking about the return on investment of GTM software solutions. Now, there are a lot of people online that I know and that I consider friends and that know my, my business philosophy. And this is very much a reflection of that as it relates to supply chain management in a tactical sense, tactically meaning what are companies, buyers and sellers of goods upon whom the entire GTM community relies, what are they trying to accomplish? Because if you don't understand that as a, either as a buyer of these services or a provider of GTM software, you might be putting yourself at a slight disadvantage or not taking full advantage of what these solutions offer. I give you that background because I've been I've been preaching this literally for 20 plus years. And that is what I call the four pillars of tactical supply chain management, meaning what goes on in a one year period, a one quarter period, a one month period when the rubber hits the road and product we're done with R&D, we're done with product development, we're we're buying and selling stuff now. What are these companies trying to do within that one year period? And I will confess or admit that these look like pretty pretty obvious. You're probably looking at that and say, looking at this and say, wow, that's that's a real revelation. <clears throat> People want to maximize their sales, sell as much as they can. Yeah, they do. But my experience has been there, there's an inverse relationship in supply chain. It's a paradox, if you will, between the declaration of, of obvious goals and the execution and completion of those goals, especially when you're dealing with 10,000 different items in a product master. You're buying from 200 suppliers overseas. You're selling to 1,000 customers overseas. And these days, you're selling online. You're selling via still hard copy catalog. You have institutional salespeople. You export. You sell domestically. This stuff, real easy to talk about not so easy to do. So the goal has to be from a GTM perspective, whether you're working directly with the buyers and sellers of goods or part of the overall broader ecosystem, you have to be thinking about these things in the end. Customer, what do they want to do? Maximize their sales, sell as much as they can, right product, right place, right time. They want to reduce their landed costs, sell at the highest price they can and buy at the lowest cost they can. There are so many solutions that, that address just these two components of that tactical supply chain. Compressed cumulative lead times, time is money, as the saying goes. And the, the shorter we can execute on the buy side of our supply chain, acquiring goods into the sell side of our supply chain, the better off we're going to be, starting with a forecast, actually. And then, of course, optimize your inventory investment. What does that mean? Well, just to illustrate and prove that I didn't just make this up last week, I have literally been singing this song for over 20 years, and I wrote about it in a book, and it's been 16 years this past April that, that my first book, I've written five, was called Supply Chain Vector. I was actually living in Mexico working for a 3PL. That's a whole other story. It took me two years to write, but it's a 280-page treatment of all of these subjects. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I've been saying this for years and it's an important component for anyone to understand what companies are really trying to accomplish. 
in a visual sense, and we'll move on quickly from this slide. In the end, supply chain comes down to sales and profits because selling goods is one thing. Making money at it is another story entirely. Maximizing your sales and profits and how much a company has to invest in inventory. Companies could say, well, our sales were up 20% this quarter, but the bad news is we had to drop another $200 million in inventory to pull it off, and now we're stuck with a bunch of stuff that people don't want. So the balance between sales and profits and inventory is honestly 75% of what supply chain is all about. And once again, regardless of where a GTM provider is in the ecosystem, selling directly to buyers and sellers of goods or as support services to 3PLs, et cetera, you have to understand this. And at some point, it's really good to be able to articulate how a value proposition addresses these goals. Tying it in to financial performance, and this is a big part of what this book is all about. The income statement of a buyer or seller of goods internationally. That's where all the sales and profits come in. Sales figures, landed cost figures, et cetera, income statement. Balance sheet, inventory investment, and believe it or not, cumulative lead times. How long it takes to get goods in and when you take title to those goods. The big thing, and this is what appeals to CFOs, for example, is cash flow from operating activities, which is a balance between what we sold and how much we had to invest in inventory to pull it off. Very, very important from a financial perspective. Let's move on. When all is said and done, the essence of global supply chain management, and it took me a long time to get to this point, to be, to be honest with you. Again, I, I wrote a book that was 280 pages explaining what supply chain was, and after 25 years or longer, I, I came to a conclusion. And that is, if you think about it, supply chain management, it's an exercise in predicting the future. Why do I say that? Well, what products is a company going to sell? What do we think will sell? Think about Steve Jobs when he came out with the first MP3 player and Apple Music. Now, here's a, here's a guy. He wasn't predicting the future. He was creating the future. So we'll definitely acknowledge that as it relates to the MP3 and then the smartphone. But what, what, are they, what are you going to sell? That's a prediction of the future. How much will we sell? That's a sales forecast. A sales forecast is nothing but a prediction of a future outcome. How much can you sell it for? That's related to your landed cost. And as the economic term goes that we all learned in Econ 101, a price that the market will bear. What's it going to cost to produce or acquire it? That's landed cost. That's a prediction. That's a budgetary prediction of the future. How long will it take? That's a lead time prediction. And how to avoid stockouts without bloating inventories. That as well is a prediction of the future. Think about it this way. Ultimately, tactical supply chain, that one year execution period, it's about very quickly identifying and then adjusting to variances between what we thought was going to happen in the future and what really took place. We have a hot product. We need to get more. We're the manufacturer. We have to get raw materials. We have hot orders coming in from customers. We're an exporter of finished goods. How long is it going to take to get those goods out to the customer? GTM software, at some point in time, has to make a contribution to achieving those goals. Supply, tactical supply chain, you know, everybody says, oh, you have to be proactive. You have to get out in front of stuff. You have to anticipate. All true. But it starts with a forecast, and the forecast is never right, and then you have to make adjustments. GTM software, wherever it is in the ecosystem, should help address that issue. All right, let's move on. <clears throat> and I'm checking our time here because those of you have, who have been on with me before know I'm a, a bit of a rambler in these 60-minute presentations turn into not 60-minute presentations. So I'm just checking a couple things here. All right, let's rock and roll. <clears throat> We're moving on to GTM solutions by function, not by company, although we will mention company names, <clears throat> but by actual function. Discrete, standalone solutions, they solve one issue, they address one issue, or the school of thought that I'm more a proponent of, integrated solutions. We're just kind of laying the groundwork here to go, in our subsequent slide is going to break things down by category. So right out, right out of the gate, ERP. And I'm talking the big ones now. 
the Oracle NetSuite, the Microsoft Dynamics 365, Infor, SAP, et cetera. ERPs, their big value prop is, is they integrate everything from forecasting to materials planning to production to payroll, capacity planning in a plant. They integrate all of those activities. House things like a product master, house that definitely a forecast that is used throughout the entire enterprise to determine how much raw materials are required, to determine when goods are going to be needed in a warehouse in Chicago. Integrated approach. We all know who the big players are. Second one is contract management. And this is a, maybe a bit misleading. I'm not, right, right, right now anyway, we're not talking about TMS stuff, transportation management systems, the, the management of contracts with, <clears throat> excuse me, with trucking lines, et cetera. We're talking about the actual contract that exists or purchase and sales agreement, it is, as it is also known, between an actual seller and buyer. An agreement to buy multiple products from multiple vendors overseas or an agreement to sell as an exporter products overseas. And one of the big challenges that companies have is that what gets agreed in a contract doesn't find its way into the actual transaction from things like product description, chosen inco term, currency of sale. All this work goes into a contract and then for whatever reason, it's not reflected in purchase orders or bills of lading or any variety of things. So we're talking about contract management for vendor and customer. Uh, there, there's an interesting company out there, I'll, I'll throw the first shout out, that addresses this issue uh, specifically as it relates to exports for agricultural companies around the world. It's called Trade Lanes. And what they have done, and I have no commercial relationship with Trade Lanes, we're just giving examples here, but take the, the components, all of the clauses found in a contract and use machine learning, use artificial intelligence, to make sure that the information as purchase orders are received from customers overseas, as commercial invoices are prepared, as bookings are made with steamship lines, sort of a, not sort of, a cascade effect all the way down the supply chain to make sure that information is consistent and addressing multiple issues. I, I know there's quite a few because I work, I work in the Central Valley and do some work with the growers up there, uh, ag people, ag exporters, Again, this isn't TMS stuff. This is end-to-end -end customer contract management solutions. Something interesting to look at. It's called trade lanes. Another, trade finance. And again, talking about letters of credit, documentary collections. Back in the day, and I used to do this when I was a youngster working in my home port of Boston for a freight forwarder, letter of credit, letters of credit, which is a, a payment mechanism for an international transaction, was all manual. And you would have to literally go to the bank to present your paperwork and your letter of credit and a draft, physically walk up to the counters of the bank and do that. It's all online now. That encompasses trade finance. Forecasting and demand planning, one of my favorite subjects in all of GTM software, a bunch of companies that do just that. MRP, materials planning, more typically related to the buy side of a cell, a, Sorry, more related to the buy side of a supply chain, where a forecast for the importation of finished goods, let's say footwear out of Vietnam, well, we have to convert that forecast into what? Purchase orders that to be placed on those vendors. That's pretty much what MRP is all about, at least in a brief kind of succinct way to describe it. The PO management component, when, a, when an international, when an importer places a PO on a company overseas, there are companies that do just the PO piece. There are companies that integrate into the transportation and the trade compliance piece. A good example of that is an outfit out of Texas called Mercado Labs that really integrates the entire buy side of the supply chain. It's not just PO management. It's not just cargo tracking. It's the integration of multiple functional activities, the entire buy side, meaning I have a forecast. I import footwear. I have to convert that forecast into purchase orders on multiple vendors at different times throughout the year. I have to manage that process. I have to know the status of those POs, have visibility into factories. I have to know when goods are ready to ship. Are they going to meet the last ship date? Was the booking for the ocean containers made on time? Cargo tracking, all of that stuff. Integration of buy-side activities, Mercado Labs, great example 
there. Inventory management, sales and operations planning. SNOP is a business function that, that's gaining some momentum in the marketplace. It's been around forever. But really what it is really applicable to international trade because what it does is it allow it forces a company to look at what was forecasted to happen in the future. And as the business year unfolds on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly basis, compare what they predicted was going to happen to what really happened and make those supply chain adjustments adjust to those variances that I spoke of previously. Big time potential in SNOP for GTM software providers. What else? Get this slide to advance, that would be helpful. DRP, distribution requirements planning. That's out on the finished goods side of things. We talked about the buy side of the supply chain. There are software providers that address the sell side of the supply chain. When and in what quantities do we need finished goods out in our distribution network to meet forecasted and actual sales? That's DRP. TMS, that's the traditional transportation management systems to manage negotiated rates and contracts with multiple carriers, be they domestic truckers or international. A bunch of companies in that space on the international side, the catapults, the, the blue jays of the world, there's freight auditing, cargo tracking, ULD, that stands for unit loading device. It could be a truck trailer, it could be an ocean container, it, it could be an air, air freight container, an LD3 or an igloo type thing. But cargo tracking, visibility anywhere in the world at the ULD purchase order, carton, interpack, and item level. That's a big time aspect of GTM software. WMS, yard management, we spoke of briefly. Here's another one that, that's come on pretty, pretty aggressively in the last couple of years, what they call digital freight marketplaces. And the, the most recognizable name, although they're, they're having some, some issues, I think COVID-19 related is, is the Uber for freight, where you go online, whether it's for a domestic load, for a drayage move from a port in the US or an international move and contract right online, no human intervention. It's a digital freight marketplace, Uber for freight. There's lots of companies out there that do that. Uh, Emerge out of Scottsdale on the FTL side of things, full truckload, uh, Cargomatic here in the United States, headquartered in Long Beach. Uh, there's a bunch of them out there, some good ones. What else? <clears throat> Just checking my time here. Actually doing pretty well. There's six or seven meaningful slides to go. And we're looking all right. I think we have a question. Just a second. Where is trade compliance? Well, <clears throat> it's on this slide. I anticipated that. Someone was asking, why isn't trade compliance up there? It is. It's, it's the third bullet. But thank you for pointing it out. Because it's really, really important. Because goods can't be moved if the actual processes and activities are not compliant. And what do we mean by compliant? Compliant with regulations for exporting or importing in multiple countries around the world because every sovereign nation can have its own regulations around exports and imports. We certainly do here in the United States. More on that in a second. What else is out there by solution? Forwarding and customs brokerage management. These are companies that sell to the actual freight forwarders and customs brokers, the operating systems that they use. And I'm talking about Descartes, Magaya, big one, Wise Tech Global out of Australia. This is big business. Reverse logistics is another. Trade compliance is a great one where, at least based on my experience, where GTM, the term GTM originally came from. The digital capability to manage export licensing capabilities, if, if we sell items that are controlled by the U.S. government. Compliance with foreign, for, uh, foreign free trade agreements is another. Using trade compliance software to link up with a product, a company's product master, which is just a list of every product that they import along with corresponding HTS numbers and any other requirements to go with it. Trade compliance is a big deal. And, and just as a, a comment, as far as the trade compliance, the traditional trade compliance elements of things are evolving, companies are moving beyond just the trade compliance component and combining it with TMS. 
company actually headquartered in Dublin called QAD Precision does just that. Just another example of how companies that started many years ago with a single solution have moved into multiple solutions. The integration of capabilities, a lot of upside to integrating trade compliance with other facets of supply chain. SNOP we talked about, and of course, big data mining, business intelligence, providing companies, buyers and sellers of goods with information from multiple aspects of the business that help them in the future. Predictive analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Let's move on. Okay. The GTM software ecosystem, and this is where 15 different categories, let's say, are going to appear. Bearing in mind that we set the scope for our conversation, I'll, I'll admit that there, there are more target markets out there, but for purposes of what we're talking about, essentially the buying and selling of goods and how GTM software supports those activities and facilitates trade in those markets, we're going to talk about importers, exporters, domestic shippers, as we said. Maybe they're a manufacturer, maybe they're just finished goods people. The three PLs, which includes logistics value added, as well as forwarding and customs brokerage, the carriers, the truckers, the drainage people, the rail people, the ocean people, the airlines, and soon to be drones, by the way. More on that in a minute. And then these other services that support those activities. So there's 15 of them. So let's run through these fairly fairly quickly. High-end ERP providers, the integrators of multiple business functions that are capable of receiving and sharing information from who? External GTM software providers. We already mentioned a few. We can move on from there. The discrete functional software houses. That's just a fancy way of saying a company that addresses one issue. We use yard management as an example. We could use material requirements planning as another example. There are companies out there that all they do is provide forecasting software. That's what we mean by discrete. They're addressing one issue. Probably more important, certainly moving forward from a value proposition perspective, are these integrated GTM providers. On the agricultural export side, we mentioned trade lanes for contract management. On the buy side, integrating multiple buy side solutions, we mentioned Mercado Labs. That's what we mean there. Traditional GTM suppliers, meaning going back to the original definition of GTM dealing with trade compliance, there are companies out there and there are forwarders who have developed their own capabilities. Perfect example, on the export side, an AES filing, the automatic automatic export system filing of electronic export information. That's traditional GTM. Software that will scan paperwork for the names of a customer overseas, a, a customer that a defense contractor is selling to, that this software will line up against the U.S. government, Department of Commerce, Department of State, et cetera, Directorate of Defense Trade Control, et cetera, and look for what's called restricted party screening, which is to say companies overseas or individuals overseas that have been sanctioned and U.S. companies can't sell to. That's another example. There, there's a bunch of them, but that's what we mean by traditional GTM. The companies that sell to the three PLs, the operating systems, we mentioned Descartes, Magaya, Wisetech Global, et cetera. The creators of 3PL-centric visibility and tracking tools. These are the companies that create the visibility. Uh, one, been around for a while, been, was acquired by Infor, is Intra. I should say, yeah, Intra. It was acquired by E2Open. Sorry, I misspoke there. There are others like Cargo Smart that are essentially the nervous system of the maritime transportation ecosystem that creates a platform that allows for the sharing, in this instance, of EDI messaging, electronic data interchange. It doesn't have to be EDI, but that's what we mean there. 3PL customer-facing solutions, things like quote, et cetera, et cetera where a customer goes online and wants a quote for an LCL shipment going from Shanghai to my home port of Boston, Massachusetts, and all the tools that will enable that in the matter of minutes using other tools like robotic process automation, RPA, that we'll talk about in a minute. Back office automation, 
be it for an actual buyer or seller of goods, are definitely into the 3PL freight forwarding space. It, it used to be that back office automation consisted of companies outsourcing some of the more redundant aspects of their business, creating bills of lading and advance ship notices. They just send it to, to uh, outsource those activities to a company in, and I've been to I've been to them in Trinidad and Tobago, believe it or not, in Costa Rica, in India, in different places. But all they were doing was re was keying in information because there was a, a labor savings associated with that exercise. These days, back office automation has to have a component of digitization, be it RPA or something else. It's an important consideration. Internet of Things solutions, the tying up of digital capabilities with Internet of Things, a good example of which is telematics and GPS. Think for a moment about ELD, electronic logging devices, which are the digital devices that truckers must carry in the United States to, to digitally track their hours of service, but also how long they're stuck in traffic. How long does a trucker have to rest, which in turn impacts lead times out to a customer? Tying in software capabilities with physical devices, we'll talk of a few more examples in just a bit, into telematics and global positioning, cargo tracking, lead times, all the things we spoke of previously. Digital freight platforms. Used to be called a load board back in the day, but they're much more sophisticated where actual TMS contracts in a TMS can be housed on a digital freight platform. So companies can allocate loads while taking advantage of market prices. Again, the Uber for freight, the emerges, the cargo Maddox, the, the next of the world. Important play there. One of my favorites, the API, application programming interface. This is really the companies that tie together or create the ability to digitally interact between multiple systems. We showed a visual some time back about all the different players in the supply chain. It used to be that EDI, electronic data interchange, was the only way to bring everybody together. That's 1970s technology. It's not going anywhere. It's going to be around for a long time, so that's a whole other conversation. But APIs kind of leapfrog that technology and tie together all these different players in a much easier to implement and more effective format. RPA, robotic process automation. Related to some back office activities, actually born in the, the finance, banking, and insurance industry, but the, the name of the category, it's a little misleading because you see robotic, you're thinking, well, it must be a robot in a warehouse or you know something like that. It's not. These are software bots that recognize terminology, that can respond without human intervention to customer inquiries, like a quote request, for example. New company. Uh, in the news, I just got some major funding. It's called RPA Labs that provides solutions to 3PLs around the quoting component, the ability to recognize terminology and create documentation like bills of lading, et cetera. I'll give you a quick example of, of RPA because I, I went through this yesterday. Uh, it's, it's been an ongoing process. But I rented a car late last year, was, was on a business trip up in the Central Valley and had an accident. No, no one was hurt. In, in fact, there wasn't even another car involved. It just, this damage to the car I rented just kind of appeared. So I'm going through the big rigmarole because I didn't get the, the insurance at the counter and I relied on my own insurance and all this business. So in speaking to, I actually spoke to someone from the insurance company and they said, you need to send me this, this, and this, because I took pictures of the damage and all that stuff. And they said, just put, here's your claim number and just put the claim number in the subject line of the email and our system will recognize it. That's RPA. Now think about the applications for that in a logistics environment and off you go. So I sent in, I sent in the pictures of, of the actual damage to the vehicle and I just put the, the claim number that they had, admittedly, they gave it to me manually over the phone and within 10 minutes, I got terms and conditions and you need to do this and you need to do that. And from that point forward, no more human intervention. That's what RPA is, lots of applications in the 
supply chain and logistics space. Big data, BI pur purveyors, the companies that actually help companies to mine information, and then the predictive analytics using historical data from multiple providers to help predict the future, improve forecasts, identify variances in lead times, identify a difference between our predicted landed cost and what a product actually cost us to get. That's what we mean there. Uh, let's see here. Just checking for more questions. I think we're good. We're almost finished. Hang tight. Okay, let's talk about the pricing models. Let me just check something real quick. Give me a second. Okay. The pricing model. This has changed a lot. And the theme of this slide is, is that if the value prop is there. These companies are creating legit solutions. But the pricing models have changed and become more reasonable. Because back in the day, you know, even today, when you talk high-end ERP, you're talking about large, very large organizations that have the resources and the money to invest in those kind of left a lot of other companies out of the game. One thing that the internet has done and GTM service providers have done has to democratize international trade, meaning making it easier for a small to medium-sized enterprises to engage in international trade and take advantage of, of these value propositions to their benefit. So what does that mean? Innovation, market acceptance, and competition have changed the way GTM software is priced. For one thing, if you think about it, and this is a part of the value prop, when approaching a potential customer, whether they're a 3PL or an actual shipper or a bank or whomever, the GTM model reduces fixed cost and or capital expenditure by the client because it's internet-based, can be accessed anywhere. The customer doesn't have to host anything on their own servers and go out and acquire those services and have 10 people to maintain them. It reduces that fixed cost and upfront capital expenditure. That's a huge attraction for companies. Lower and sometimes eliminated, I'm not recommending that GTM providers give the shop away, but some don't even charge licensing and or subscription fees. In some instances they do, and in most of those instances they're justified for, for doing so. Here's the big one, one of the big ones viewing this from the actual buyer of, of GTM software solutions. Variable versus fixed cost. And this goes back to point number one, where I have to buy into the, to the software. I have to get all of the servers and networking equipment and all that good stuff. I can go straight to a variable cost environment as opposed to fixed costs for the upfront capital investment. What, what does that mean? Well, depending on what I do, let's say I'm an exporter and I'm looking to track outbound containers. I can pay for that service by container, whatever the price might be, by load on the, on the truckload side of things, by carton, by sales order, by purchase order, by whatever the transaction happens to be, it's a variable model. And that's very attractive because I, as the user of these GTM solutions, pay for what I use. Could there be a combination of variable plus some licensing and or subscription? Sure. That's part of the pricing model. That's part of the strategy of the provider. It's also part of the negotiation that goes on between the user and the purveyor. There's definitely not as much customization required, you know, out of the box. You can start using these solutions literally the same day. So less need for implementation consultants. And then depending on what you're doing, if you need some APIs done, or some RPA work, you can get pricing on a project specific basis. The pricing model has changed dramatically in a way that has facilitated global trade exponentially. What, what's that mean? The value prop is there, but the barriers to entry from a financial perspective have come down. That's what we mean there. Let's move on. Okay, I have one minute to go through five slides. So <laughs> what are the challenges for GTM software firms? And, th and this is where a lot of, of, I'll admit it, a lot of my personal opinion comes in because I talk to these people all day long. Many of them are my clients. What are some of the challenges that they face? Well, number one, growing competition. There's, there's no shortage of companies coming into all facets of, of the ecosystem. So 
How do you differentiate oneself in the marketplace as a provider of these services? And a risk of being leapfrogged, meaning you come up with a solution that you think is pretty slick, and then two months later, somebody builds a better digital mousetrap. It happens all the time, especially as it relates to companies that offer one solution versus companies that offer multiple solutions. And that equation, that calculus is always going to be in favor of the company that offers, offers multiple solutions. Number two, I see this all the time, translating operational know-how into digital capabilities. What the heck does that mean? Well, I, again, I see it all the time. And, and I'm in the first part of this equation. So I'm part of this challenge. Operators, people that know a lot about supply chain, logistics, trade finance, trade compliance operations, but they can't write code. And then you have the code writers that don't understand the details of operations. In fact, one of the things that my company does, trade facilitators, is help bridge that gap. But I definitely reside on this side of the equation. You can hold a gun to my head and ask me to write a simple program and it would be it would be over. Third, developing a value prop that solves multiple problems. We spoke of this a couple of times now. There are a fair amount of discrete solutions in the market that address one issue and one issue only. This is opinion, but I think the more solutions a company can bring to the table in an integrated fashion to solve actual multiple problems and use big data, data mining to help customers and other facets of their business, that's where the big action is. The fourth one, I see this all the time as well, GTM providers sometimes, not always, have a challenge articulating their own value proposition. What is it exactly that you do? What do you address? What value do you create? And that comes down to having a C-level pitch that slide where we showed the four pillars of supply chain, a CFO pitch, the balancing of, of sales and expense with inventory investment, those type of high level pitch, you know, make it pop at the top, as, as I like to say, but also a tactical pitch to people that are actually executing on these jobs and how the solution facilitates trade. Believe it or not, companies have challenges articulating their own value prop. I see it fairly frequently. What else? Monetizing the value proposition. How do these companies make money? How do they charge? Going back to the pricing model discussion we had a moment ago and fine tuning of the pricing models. I've, I've heard some, some pretty interesting numbers being, being thrown around there and how companies, essentially how they bill. You have to tie the pricing model into the value prop, I guess is what we're saying there. Here's another one. Senior management with limited operational experience in supply chain. Now, we already talked about the operators that can't write code and the code writers that don't know operations. That's not necessarily what we're talking about here. I've made this observation. Companies that, that have knowledge of a specific component of supply chain, had some exposure to some discrete activities in supply chain, have a good idea, very smart people, but start bringing in people from outside the industry. And sometimes, not always, sometimes that doesn't work. And, and as a person who deals in this stuff all the time, I can pick those people out in a heartbeat just by virtue of the fact of having a conversation with them where they, they misuse terminology and, and use acronyms gratuitously. You want people that know the business. And I'll give you another very good example of this. And, and I'll, I'll confess that these are business associates and friends of mine, Mercado Labs. These are people that come from the industry. You know, in, in, in the buy side of the supply chain, buy importers for importers, you know, kind of the FUBU thing. Th these are people that have been around a while, know the details, worked for importers, worked in logistics. This is my personal opinion. You want to be dealing with companies that have that experience and not someone that came from PayPal. And that's, again, it's an opinion. You might dispute that. You're certainly entitled to do so. Third bullet point, self-inflicted creation of an inflated cost structure. We're trying to be euphemistic here, where companies come in and they just start blowing cash left and right. It's called bootstrapping for a reason. And even after your you know, seed funding and you know, A round, B round, C round, there has to be an element of frugality there. And you can just see it where people are creating cost structures that they really don't need to. 
Harnessing big data and business intelligence to the benefit of the entire enterprise. This is creating value in a specific area or areas, but as a natural consequence of those activities, generating information that can be used in other parts of the business, forecasting to start with. And then the final one, this is the Jerry Maguire tieback. You had me at hello. You're not always going to have customers at hello. Getting customers to make that leap of faith, to share product masters, to share their actual sales contracts, to open up the kimono from a technology perspective. These are literally career-altering decisions that these customers are making. So getting them to make that leap of faith, not so easy. Not so easy at all. Hold on a second. A couple questions here. As a BCO, that's a beneficial cargo owner. That's a shipper, basically. Forwarders often use GTM as a selling differentiation point. True. I only care about, A, accuracy of timely info. This, this is from an actual BCO. So this is good advice. Check this out. I only care about, A, accuracy of timely information. Search, ver this is really important, search variables, meaning that as an importer or an exporter, you want to search by purchase order number, by sales order number, container number, item number, or any of the above. Super important. And thank you for making that observation, Daniel. That's also who predicted, show me the money. So you're two for two, my man. <clears throat> All right, almost finished, and thank you for sticking around. A couple more, couple more slides. Value creation, opportunities for further innovation and value creation. Hold on. Where's the action for, for these companies? Moving the present and into the not-too-distant future. I've said this a couple of times. Big data mining from multiple functional areas that enhance demand planning. Demand planning, it's really forecasting, sales order management, the actual orders that come in in an omni-channel environment and available to promise of inventory. But the point here is everything starts with a forecast. And I think we all know in both our professional and personal lives that when you try to predict the future, it's not always going to work out that way. But if you can get information from other facets of the business that will enhance demand planning, there, there's big, big, big value in that. And you don't even have to be a demand planning software purveyor. You just have to be someone who has access to information based on your own activities that are linked to demand planning. And trust me when I tell you, everything is linked to demand planning. Predictive analytics for sales and operations planning. Well, of course, if sales and operations planning is about making adjustments, tactical operational adjustments between the variances of a forecast and what actually happened. That's what SNOP is, predictive analytics, pretty helpful there. Identification of variances before they happen. Helping people to be proactive as averse to reactive in a forecast sense. Event milestones. We're an importer, we wanna change a purchase order, on a particular item because it's not selling very well, we, we want to either cancel that PO or reduce the amount on the PO. How about a system that based on contractual information, based on the PO itself, will tell us ahead of time that your last change date on a PO is such and such a date and the last cancellation date is such and such a date. Proactively, without ever having to go look for it. That's, what, that's one example of what we're talking about there. Of course, ongoing integration of multiple functions that ERP approach, but connectivity with other systems, external systems, especially through APIs. We've got a couple more to go here. Thanks for sticking around. Continued emphasis on the repurposing of information. Think about this. And we said it already. We're an importer of footwear out of Vietnam. We have a forecast for shoes that we sell all the time, but a bunch of new product introductions as well. We have to convert that forecast into the purchase orders that we place on the vendors, multiple vendors overseas. The vendor's going to go into production. They're going to do their thing. When the stuff is ready, they're going to make a booking with the steamship line. A bill of lading is going to be created. An advanced ship notice is going to be created. A dock receipt is going to be created. A customs entry is going to be created. 
a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times it's the same information. So how do you repurpose that information, going back to Daniel's earlier point, in a timely and accurate way, so the redundancy is moved from the process. And the process itself is accelerated from an accurate, from the generation of accurate information perspective. Supply chain and logistics apps for robotic process automation. I'm a big fan of that. Machine learning and artificial intelligence. The application thereof to these redundant tasks and activities. Outsourcing of back office activities that are supported by digital capabilities like robotic process automation. Further integration of the Internet of Things with GTM software. One example we mentioned, ELD, that's the electronic logging device that truckers by law through the Department of Transportation in the U.S. have to keep a log of their driving, mainly from a fatigue management perspective and reducing accidents on the highway. But this will tell the life story, not only of the driver, but the load that they're carrying. So an example is a link of ELD info out to for domestic timing of an FTL full truckload delivery, maybe to a fulfillment by Amazon distribution center that only receives by appointment, that's some pretty helpful information to have. Here's one, and I'm waiting for this day, uh, and I just saw this the other day, no, yesterday, that UPS got approved by the FAA for drone delivery of actual products. So think about this, and, and this isn't Jetson stuff. This is within the next year or two, that you'll be sitting, hopefully not because of coronavirus, but you'll be sitting in your home and you're waiting for a prescription to be delivered, and you know it's coming by a drone, and you'll be sitting watching hopefully a football game or a baseball game or whatever it is you do, and Alexa is going to say to you, your drone delivery is going to be here in two minutes. Come to your front door. That's not Jetson stuff. You'll see that in the next year or two. So drones and voice-activated B2C, business-to-consumer and business-to-business delivery notice. These are just examples integrating the physical world into the digital world, the analog world to the digital world. Almost done. Solutions that create multiple degrees of separation from the status quo and our competition. Not just innovation, but creating completely new spaces. Innovation is super important, but leapfrogging the competition. I just read yesterday that FedEx, for example, on the logistics side of things, needless to say, teams up with Azure and Microsoft Dynamics, Microsoft Dynamics 365 being their ERP, to integrate ERP activities with the logistics support that FedEx can provide. That's heavy duty. Pay attention to that. And then links into systems like Salesforce.com, which is much more than a CRM. A couple more, the use of big data from one area of the supply chain to enhance performance in the other. Here's one, a KPI, a key performance indicator, that tracks the number of changes to a purchase order to the benefit of sales and operations planning. What, what does that mean? Well, if there are multiple changes, there's usually a reason. Well, there's always a reason for a change to a purchase order. We want to buy more. We want to buy less. We want to cancel the PO. Sometimes, a lot of times, that's related to the variances between what was forecasted for a product, the shoes that we buy in Vietnam from multiple vendors, and what we're actually selling. Envision a scenario where a provider on the buy side of the, the supply chain, integrates PO management with in-factory visibility, with transportation management, et cetera, but then can automatically say to a customer, based on their big data mining, this, these POs that have product ABC123 and maybe a couple others on there, you're making way more changes to these POs than you are to other products. Might it be that your forecast was a little off or at least tell a customer it's something to look at. That's where real value comes from. Data-enabled key performance indicators tied directly to a GTM solutions capabilities as well. All right, this is the last slide. So you're sticking around. You, you guys are great. I appreciate that. But I, I get so amped up about this stuff. It's just so interesting to me. I, I hope you you share the my enthusiasm. Uh, we have someone asking, list of softwares we can look into in order to make a better decision on what software is convenient to choose for your specific case. Well, I'd, I'd need to know what your specific case is. 
Um, is there, oh, sorry, I missed part of the question. Is there some sort of directory? Um, yeah, there is actually. It's um, and you can get it for free. If you go in Google, it's uh, it comes from Inbound Logistics Magazine. I actually was studying it uh, just the other day. It's called the the top 100 GTM software providers, and it's a it's a good tool. It's it's not an exhaustive tool, you know, top 100 at least according to them. But it's a good place to start. Hold on a second. All right, yeah, there's some good questions here. Hold on. <clears throat> Are you familiar with, and if so, where would you place the services of, provided by the companies Yamasoft and Amber Road? I, I can comment more on Amber Road because they're a uh, full disclosure, uh, a client of mine. Uh, they were they were actually acquired by E2 Open, which is a company that you want to pay attention to because they have made multiple acquisitions in an effort to integrate, do much of what we're talking about here. Uh, they acquired Intra which was the EDI platform for maritime transportation and PO management. So Amber Road, great example. Amber Road started out as a discrete GTM, traditional GTM provider, meaning restricted party screening, AES filings, et cetera. They branched out into things like PO management, uh, free trade agreements. At one time, I, I, I don't think they have it anymore, but they also had a, a package that did contract management for ocean carriers. So I, I would put them within that framework of E2Open's multifaceted solution to address traditional GTM with some cargo tracking and PO management capabilities as well. All right, whoops. So some of my favorite solutions, we'll, we'll wrap things up here. And this should be fairly predictable based on some of the things that I've said. But solutions that enhance demand planning and sales operations planning, it, it's the holy grail. Supply chain at a tactical level starts with a prediction of the future. How much product are we going to sell? What can we sell it for? How long does it take they're going to get it? Anything that can enhance demand planning and making adjustments to variances between what was forecasted and what really happened – whether it's a, a solution specific to that or other parts of the supply chain that big data can be mined to enhance that function, big time. And I think a lot of companies out there are, are sitting on data that they don't realize what it's capable of doing outside the realm of their specific value proposition. Big fan of APIs, it, it, it's the wiring that, that, that connects all the players in the supply chain, integrated solutions that solve multiple customer challenges. I gave a bunch of examples of those. You can repurpose information. You can use that BI in other areas tying back to this. I don't know what the future is for discrete solutions other than being acquired by companies that want to build out their own capabilities. AI, machine learning, and RPA, big fan of this. RPA for those redundant tax tasks, and then item level tracking that transcends international to domestic environment for B2B, business to business, and B2C. Believe it or not, it's still kind of difficult to track an item from its origin at a PO level to a customer's door, maybe delivered by a drone with the delivery advice provided by Alexa. That transition from an international to a domestic environment from a, for a bunch of different reasons, units of measure, different terminology, a bunch of different things. This is still hard to do. So I think there's some upside there. Uh, let's see here. Hold on. The directory, I'm just looking at the questions here. Uh, yeah, okay, so that's it. Thank you for sticking around. I know a couple people had to bail, but most everybody stuck around, so that's always flattering. I hope you found it useful. You want a copy of the presentation? Write to me here. Do you want to engage trade facilitators for any and or all of the services that we alluded to at the front end of the presentation? Call or write to us here. Will there be a recording of the presentation? Yes, there will. And I would encourage people to avail themselves, share it with your, your workmates and such. I know it's hard to take an hour and goodness, 15 minutes, sorry about that, almost 20 minutes now to do that. So thank you for your patience. Stay safe. Memorial Day is coming up. Most of the country. 
I heard on the news that in some way, shape, or fashion, all 50 states are opening up some way. And, and that's important for everybody, but especially for parts of the country that have a long winter. I mean, it's always nice. Well, not always, but 95% of the time, it's nice in California. So we're a little spoiled. So stay safe, observe your local rules and regulations, and tune in next week. We're going to do U.S. free trade agreements, benefits for importers and exporters. If you have any questions after the fact, you can just write them into that email address. And that is it. Thank you to everybody for tuning in, and enjoy the rest of your week. Hasta luego.